But from Wexford County Council's point of view, this was the most important project we were ever involved in. And we were very pleased to work in partnership with the National Roads Authority and the Department of Transport in securing this very major investment for the county. The road cost just 200 million to build and we were very pleased that it is a crucial project in the entire Transport 21 programme for roads, the road network in this country. It's impossible to overemphasise the economic importance of this particular project to County Wexford. Given our peripheral location, access to the county is crucial and this particular road will give us a competitive edge when it comes to trying to attract investment in tourism and industry in the county. The N11 Gory to Oclo Link project is one of seven uh, projects to be undertaken in County Wexford under the National Development Plan 2000-2006 National Roads Programme. The NDP programme has since uh, then been in, included or incorporated into the Transport 21 programme. The 500 million euro County Wexford programme connects Ireland Europort at Rosslare to the major centres of population as Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Waterford, Galway and also connects to the other major ports at Larne and Cork. The NRA's project management guidelines are used in all national road projects. There are six separate and distinct phases. Phase 1. Initial Project Planning Planning for national road projects takes place in the context of the government's objectives for investment in road infrastructure. Initially, the need for a scheme is agreed between the local authority, Wexford County Council in this case, and the NRA. The National Roads Authority. A project brief is then drawn up and consultants are appointed. I suppose the main purpose of that phase would be to agree and put in place um, management structures, funding structures, etc. and basically get to get the project kicked off and approved by the NRA. Phase 2 Constraint Study during the early stages of the planning of a national road project, information is gathered in relation to various constraints that exist which could affect the design and location of the scheme. These include physical, like mountains, rivers, lakes, legal and environmental constraints. It's essentially a desktop study, an information gathering exercise as to say. To put it in simple terms is we will get a large scale OS map and try to demarcate a study area and that's the corridor that we would be looking at. We were able to thread a road along the side roads between houses so that the demolition of houses was reduced as much as possible. Well we certainly hope at this stage that we have mitigated or eliminated those constraints quite successfully. Phase 3 Route Corridor Selection the National Roads Authority has developed uh, guidelines for local authorities and for our consultants in order to assist them in the route selection uh, process. Essentially the identification of route corridors um, extends from identifying any number of corridors that are achievable. Um, broadly speaking, the uh, consultants or our local authorities identify possible corridors within what's called a study area and those corridors are then analysed under a number of criteria. Typically those criteria would be environmental impacts, um, journey times, uh, length of the actual corridors, and any major significant constraints, be they archaeology, um, geophysical, uh, hydrology, water courses, rivers, etc. So within any individual project, our consultants or our local authorities identify a number of corridors for consideration. These are broad corridors to a level of engineering that would reflect the stage of the design at that particular point in time. 
and then a, a matrix for analysis of each of those corridors is developed and arising out of that analysis a preferred root corridor is identified and once that preferred root corridor is identified that's brought back into the public consultation process again so that individual landowners and members of the public can feed their comments back on the preferred corridor back to our designers. All those comments are taken on board again and eventually after full consideration a root corridor is recommended to the local authority and then from then on to the International Roads Authority for formal approval. So a very important part of the process that we worked through um, during constraints, option and the preparation of the environmental impact statement was the public consultation. So during, um, when we identified the constraints, we had a meeting in Gorey where we presented the constraints to um, the people there, we advertised that meeting and that gave people an opportunity to come along to us and say, okay, you think there are other constraints maybe you should consider and that was very important. And then at the next stage, obviously during um, the selection of options, um, it was very important that we show people the options that we were considering and give them an opportunity to input into that process and to help us understand what the significant implications of those options were. Phase 4. Preliminary Design and Statutory Procedures. Phase 4 involves preparing a preliminary design for the scheme and the determination of more precise land acquisition requirements. So the process that we were involved in is we worked with um, the Road Design Office in Tremor House and they produced a preliminary design scheme and they sent it to us but it was a very integrated process so we would have looked at it, we would have looked at the environmental impacts of that preliminary design scheme and, um, and then basically we went through a process of tweaking and it's a great engineering word that we all use and so they tweaked the scheme, it came back to us in, in order to minimise the environmental impact so to, you know, to improve the noise properties of the road scheme on some of the houses to avoid a particular ecological site a little you know, to make sure that we were a good clear distance from it etc. I suppose in terms of the land acquisition mm -hmm. again that was prepared by from our house for the purposes of putting forward a compulsory purchase order which is made by Wexford County Council our role was to accurately determine the lands required. So we were talking about acquiring over 500 acres of land. It is only at this stage that a clearer picture begins to emerge as to the location of the route and road characteristics, such as vertical and horizontal alignments, as well as the specific impacts on individual land holdings and residences. It is during this phase that the compulsory purchase order motorway scheme is made to acquire lands and properties necessary for the project. The farm here was purchased by my father in 1945 and we began dairying here in 1950. At the time that the new road was announced we had built our milk quota up to 120,000 gallons. We had brought up our acres up to 175 acres. We were really shocked to find that we were going to have approximately 32 acres of our good grazing ground cut off. Uh, originally we were able to move our lives up right from the farmyard up an access roadway which travelled right here and up and onto this other land. Now the only way we can access that land with livestock is from here, out under this new bridge and up here. So it's at least double the length of what it was. About a year after the bypass had been announced and when we saw that there was no other way to continue the area, we decided to take a different option. We got an opportunity to sell off some land with the intention to buy a more suitable place for our dairy enterprise. Fortunately, the first couple of years, we were lucky to have access to our neighbour's land and that gave us time to relocate. Uh, it's a 120 acre dairy farm. Um, with approximately 150 cows and uh, we make all year round. We sent my brother in partnership from the 20th of uh, October 2005 we're using the piece of land that we're going to CPO. The 11 acres that I lost is inside the blue line, it's that strip here, that's the bypass strip yeah. and then there's various pieces of land here taken for uh, drainage works and access and uh, straightening of the original Balik New Road. Of course, the, the way the farm is situated, the, the new bypass cuts off uh, a portion of maybe 20 acres from the main block of land. We access it now uh, that the road is constructed by a tunnel, uh, which was agreed to by Roadbridge. 
Uh, the farm now is 109 acres. We have to replace that grazing ground by renting land in a different area, but you know, it's the best we can do. Phase five, construction, documentation, preparation, tender process, and award of contract. Once the planning and design processes have been completed and statutory approval obtained, the project may proceed to tender, advertisement and award. The tender process must observe EU directives on procurement. At this stage you're really sort of concentrating on the actual physical work that has to be done and you're trying to encapsulate it, get a scoping together um, to allow tendering to proceed as smoothly as possible. Roadbridge Limited were one of five contractors who tendered for the N11 Gory Tartar scheme. Obviously we were the successful tender. Uh, the tender date was the 22nd of July 2005. The contract signing was on the uh, 16th of December and we commenced works here in, on the 8th of November 2005. Phase 6, construction. Possibly the most complex part of the process, the construction phase utilises a vast range of skills and resources. We will now take an in-depth look at some of the main areas involved. But first, the project manager, Morgan Sheehy, gives us some details on Roadbridge, the contractor responsible for construction of the Gorey Bypass. Roadbridge Limited is a limited company formed in December of 1999. It was formerly known as Pat Mulcair Civil Engineering, who operated as a sole trader since 1967. Roadbridge's main area of expertise is road construction, bridge construction, gas pipelines and various other infrastructure projects. Uh, it has a workforce of approximately uh, 800 employees and are proud to say we operate the largest plant fleet within Ireland. Roadbridge Limited are committed to quality and have a record of delivering schemes on time and within budget. As an aside, we have obtained this ISO quality accreditation status as well as ISO 14001 for the environment and 18001 for safety. As far as I'm aware, Roadbridge Limited are the only civil contractor to have achieved all accreditations. Design and build is a relatively new form of contract introduced by the NRA. It involves a contractor getting more involved in that he provides his own design team to design, supervise and inspect the works to the satisfaction of the employer's requirements and specifications outlined by the employer. This current scheme, the N11 Gory Tarklow Link, is probably the biggest design and build scheme constructed to date. Design and Engineering The teams of engineers and designers from Tremor House Regional Design Office, from Fehali Timoney Gifford, from Roadbridge Limited and from Wexford County Council are all involved in making sure that the design and build process is carried out in the most efficient way. Indeed, as senior engineer for Roadbridge, um, I will be involved a lot in the coordination of the design and all elements of construction for the scheme. That's taken the scheme from very early stages through, right through the design development and also delivering that through a series of drawings and specifications so that our team on the ground can construct the project with all the information and assistance that they need. The size of this road, 22 kilometres of high quality dual carriageway with the 34 or, or odd structures requires a huge design input, um, both from the consultants themselves and our own team. I'm des designer site representative um, for Feely Timney Gifford on site um, and I work with a design team of eight engineers comprising I suppose of geotechnical engineers, drainage experts, structures, earthworks, pavements safety barriers and so forth. My particular discipline would be structures, but as design or site representative I'd head up the team. Our role would involve monitoring the works and ensuring compliance with the construction drawings and design and compliance with the NRA spec and standards. If there's changes to design, minor changes, as part of the design team we can issue a design change which allows the contractor to progress with the works while the drawings are being revised in the design office. So I feel like it's a, it's a quick far away of moving on and, issue and making changes to the design. Difficulties and changes. As Pierre Lachlan has said, on-site changes are an integral part of the design and build process. One specific factor to have had an effect on the construction phase was the nature of the soil beneath the root of the bypass. The Macklemore clays were deposited um, by ice from the Irish Sea during the, the sail age. Okay. That's a long time ago. Very dense, cancerous, marine mud and oozes 
and I suppose for the layperson a comparison to a bar of soap and when it's dry it's very hard and when it's uh, in, in poor wet conditions it's very it's like slurry. Now the extent of the Macklemore clays was approximately 10,600 linear meters out of 22,900 so it's almost half the scheme affected and uh, on Tremor House they were drawing up a specimen design and typically side slopes will be one vertical, two horizontal because of these fears and concerns. They opted for a conservative design of one vertical, three horizontal and that impacted on the need for land. Structures. Specific structures like overbridges, underpasses and rail bridges form an area of specialist design within the overall construction process. Michael Gallagher from Roadbridge and Duncan Cole from Wexford County Council will now explain some of the challenges involved. Uh, my role is as site agent uh, over the structures, is to coordinate and program the structures, uh, the construction of the structures, uh, in order to facilitate the earthworks program. Yeah, in summary, there's 19 main bridge structures. 10 of these consist of over bridges. This allows traffic to go over the main through the carriageway. There's seven uh, under bridges. This allows traffic to go underneath. There's two railway structures, four main river structures, and then there's uh, 10 accommodation underpasses. These are accommodations for local landowners to drive them for vehicle and cattle. And there's six of them then just for cattle. All in all, there's 45 main structures on the on the scheme. One of the main constraints in the construction of this bridge was to lower the existing road levels, construct the bridge abutments, straw the bridge deck, but at the same time uh, only affect vehicular traffic uh, for a period of one week. This was uh, achieved due to the excellent support team both at a managerial level and also on a site level. My role in, as, as a, a resident engineer has been to look after the structures on the project. Uh, mainly bridges of which there are 20. In particular there are two bridges that uh, have uh, needed special attention. Those are two railway bridges on the project. Um, one of them is uh, at Kuna Stud and the other one is at Kula Dangan. Some of the interesting parts of the bridges were carried out at night time where we had to take possessions of the railway in order to place beams on the abutments. During these, these um, sessions of work at night time, safety was of paramount um, and uh, there was a lot of large equipment and we were working in the dark so it was an exciting time on the project for most people and there were many sightseers. Finally we have the bridges completed virtually at the stage and what one sees if one's in a train at the large of the two bridges is just a tunnel running through the, uh, underneath the road. The other bridge is shorter and more conventional, but both bridges have an aesthetic appeal and they add greatly to the project, as well as um, during the construction they added a great deal of excitement to the staff and those involved in the construction. Obtaining materials and quality assurance. As construction proceeds, there is a constant demand for a huge variety of building materials. In accordance with NRA guidelines, these need to be certified. Shane Hart and Roland Tarrant explain in greater detail. I suppose the main responsibility I would have would be the financial management of the project. Uh, now we have a team of three of us here, two myself and two other quantity surveyors, and uh, we would have three administration staff. Our main responsibility is the financial management for the main contract, which is obviously road bridge, and other responsibilities would include procurement of subcontracts and procurement of materials. Our paving contractor would be uh, Roadstone. Now this is the single biggest subcontract in any road project really. Just to give you an idea of what is involved there, it would lay in around 400,000 tonne of thermic atom, covering an area of about 600,000 square metres. More unusual ones is that we would hire the likes of road sweepers and that to maintain the, the minor roads and, and uh, public roads where, where we would be crossing over. We would supply our canteen for the welfare facilities for our workers. That would all be done locally um, because it's good practice and probably cheaper at the end of the day. Okay, there obviously be a lot of different materials that we would need to procure, drainage pipe, uh, concrete, steel and so forth. But I suppose the main material would be uh, broken stone. We would take in about, I'd say, 1.6 million tonne of broken stone throughout the duration of the contract. 
I suppose the main priority, as I would say it anyway, is that we deliver a quality product first of all, and that we deliver it on time, and if we can bring it in under budget, then that's a bonus, you know. Um, my job title is Quality Manager. I'm responsible for all of the materials brought to site and the procedures used on site to construct the works. Basically, um, all of the materials would have to have some form of certification, some form of uh, compliance with the relevant contract documents or the NRA specification. Basically, before any tarmac is brought to site, you have to do a trial area, which is basically a, a run of material laid out that is tested then and that verifies your procedures. It makes sure your procedures are compliant with the relevant documents. We have an on-site lab which has full accreditation for the tests carried out, which is also part of the requirement of the contract. Every single element of the job has its own particular test to be carried out or certification. So everything from the fencing to the drainage stone used to the pipes that are used to the tarmac, to the lines that go down on the road, even the rebar that goes into the bridges, every single element of the whole package is all certified independently. Well, some elements have 120 year design life, but some of them have 20 and 40 years. So you're actually ensuring that the, the probability is that the material will last for the duration that you, you expect it to be um, usable in. Archaeological discoveries. An important part of the overall process is an archaeological investigation and assessment of the lands to be used for construction. Bernice Kelly and James Ogan from the NRA Archaeology Section in Tremor House in County Waterford explain further. These excavations have generated a significant body of information relating to the early occupation of North Wexford. Over 100 archaeologists from 16 different countries worked from 8 in the morning until 5 in the evening over a six month duration to resolve these sites. Wexford County Council and the National Roads Authority are committed to disseminating the excavation results for the public benefit. Efforts were made in the course of the excavations to engage and communicate with local people. For example, school groups were facilitated, members of the archaeological profession and other related professions were encouraged to come and visit the excavations during the course of the works. The local press proved to be a very useful tool in publicising the progress and the results of the excavations and the NRA itself also has put together these brochures which detail the significant finds and sites that were encountered in the course of the works. These brochures are being circulated at the moment within the local community and beyond. Once the post-excavation analysis has come to an end, the NRA is going to fund the publication of the final excavation results. The standing stone then in ASK we uh, had identified a, a at the stage of the environmental impact statement. It was previously unknown, it hadn't been identified by any previous archaeological surveys that were done in Wexford. It was a very small monument, uh, about a metre twenty high or so. When I first saw it, it was in, it was in, a, in a barley field, so you could barely see it uh, above the crop, and that's probably why it hadn't been previously identified, a very low-level monument. The interesting thing about standing stones is that they can range in date from any period, from the earliest uh, Neolithic period, uh, when monuments were first built in, in the country, right through even to the, to the 19th century, when farmers would have put up standing stones to act as scratching stones for their cattle. This end of the stone, which you can see with the sort of brown staining on it, was buried in the ground. You can see how it's uh, uh, pointed, a uh, pit was, was dug by the people who erected it and they, they literally stood it upright. Uh, the interesting thing about the, the, the stone is that uh, it's been shaped at this end, so the, so the end that would have stood above the, 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 the ground and would have been visible as a monument and the people who erected it had knocked slabs or, or pieces off it in order to shape it into this roughly square section. Uh, we'll we'll re-erect it on the top of that of that flat bank so that uh, people who are exiting the, the, the bypass and coming off here at Tinnock as they drive up the slip road uh, will get a good view of this uh, ancient monument in its in its in its new location. The percent for art scheme Operating in conjunction with every public capital scheme, like the N11 Gory to Arklow link, is the Government Percent for Art scheme. Provision is made for the commissioning of a piece of art. Rosalind Malloy elaborates. Well, the Percent for Art scheme is a government initiative 
which was developed um, a number of years ago to be able to support the arts um, through uh, capital construction projects. So really what happens is that 1% of the total cost of a capital construction project such as the building of a house or a housing scheme or a road for example is ring fenced and that money is then given to um, the local authority or whatever commissioner for the commissioning of an artwork and what we have decided from a programming point of view is that that will be a piece of public sculpture for the public to enjoy. What has happened to date in the implementation of the scheme in association with the Goya Bypass is that we advertised for a piece of sculpture to be commissioned and the identified site for that sculpture was the new Rahini Garden Junction. So the thinking is that you don't have to go into a gallery or to an art centre or a theatre to experience the arts, that really art can become a part of the everyday fabric of our environment and of our life. Completion and opening. Uh, the benefits for the, the town, indeed the county of Wexford, uh, are, are significant. They're already evident from the uh, bypass of the town itself. Uh, uh, much improved uh, conditions within the town. Uh, it's much easier for pedestrians, uh, for people wishing to do business, trade within the town, to move around the town itself. Uh, you can get in and get out a lot more quickly, conveniently, and it's obviously a safer environment. I remember a time, maybe five or six years ago, where I first heard Gory on AA Roadwatch on the radio. And it was quite surprising that, you know, we're being mentioned on national radio. Then it became a daily event. So there's been huge anticipation for the bypass to be completed and opened. And the very fact that it was partly opened to allow for a town bypass three or four months before the full completion was a fantastic initiative by all involved to get it open. And we have immediately seen the benefit of traffic that was never destined for Gory can now pass it by if it wishes to. It also means that what's not there leaves more space for those who want to be there. So now we have people who can visit Gory in a relaxed atmosphere, they can find parking, they can drive up and down the main street, it doesn't take them 20 minutes to travel three or four hundred yards, they can relax a little bit more. And it's great for the business community to have that. Naturally when you start to see bridges being constructed and uh, heavy articulated dumpers bringing loads of earth, you anticipate problems, you anticipate dirty roads, you anticipate congestion, you anticipate road closures that are going to be hugely inconvenient and I have nothing but praise for Roadbridge and the way they managed that aspect of the construction phase. It had minimal impact on the business community, there was proper and full consultation. Roads that were closed were closed for the shortest periods of time necessary and diversions where they were put in place were properly signposted and properly thought out. So I have nothing but praise for that aspect of the construction. But the effects have been phenomenal. It's wonderful to see the freedom it brings to the town in terms of getting around and, and doing business and bringing kids to school and, and whatever else one wants to do. So we're delighted. Well, I think that great credit is due to the contractor in particular for the very professional and efficient way the job was done. And what must be mentioned is on a job of this size that health and safety was, was uh, put to the forefront. And thankfully, there was no uh, major incident uh, on this particular project and I think that uh, that goes down to the attention to detail and professionalism of the people involved. So it's an opportunity for the town now I think to, to grow and prosper and um, the authority together with Wexford County Council uh, will be advancing work on the next section of the route. Well clearly the opening of the bypass in Gory of course has placed greater emphasis now on the need to do the clock to an escorty bypass and we're very pleased to say that planning is at an advanced stage for that particular job as well. So as I say, much work has been done, more to do indeed, but that is in hand to a significant degree and uh, we're working to deliver the government's objective, as I say, of a dual carriageway motorway standard road all the way from Dublin to Rosslare. Let us turn to him 
to bless us on all our journeys through life. Let us pray that this roadway will be a source of safe and easy travel, a way that will lead people towards each other and not to their destruction or to harm. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. Let us pray for all who travel the nation's roads, that they will be responsible and caring and mindful of the safety of themselves and others. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. very, very special occasion. I'm delighted to be here. I feel a little bit like uh, De Valera um, addressing this kind of a, an occasion. I think some of you will recall the story about De Valera who was making a speech, I think, in Ennis, and he was arrested there. And uh, he, uh, when he was released from jail, he came back and uh, started the next speech in Ennis by saying, as I was saying before I was interrupted. <laughs> uh, it's five years ago since I performed a, a road opening function. Um, I performed quite a few of them before that as Minister for the Environment. Uh, this particular road was uh, beginning on its design, on the early stages of design and planning. So it's nice to be back on an occasion like this and a happy occasion like this. And I want to pay tribute to everybody that's been involved in bringing the project to fruition. Uh, obviously the NRA, the two local authorities, uh, the local communities, the local landowners, everybody that has been involved in the building and design uh, of the project. It's, it's a road, but it's much more than that. I know that the people of Glory, and indeed the long-suffering travellers through Glory, and I was one of those on several occasions, heading to Ross Lair, will say a word of thanks to uh, everybody that was involved in the project it's, itself. Um, it is hugely important for the town, for the county, and for the South East. Uh, I look forward uh, to completion of the works on the N11 in the shortest time scale possible, and that's something to be able to share with the N11. So again, congratulations to uh, everybody involved in it, and uh, thank you for showing up in such a large number. I think that is a clear indication of the importance of the project to the county, both counties, uh, and to the region itself. Very well. 